Well, I am happy to be back with you all. Uh, you, you guys had, I think, what, Father Dave Rosenberg last Sunday at the 10, is that right? For those of you who are at the 10. Anybody remember what he preached on? I want to make fun of him. What did he say? <laughs> no, I hope, uh, um, I hope he did well for you. He's a good, he's a good holy man. Uh, I was on last week, my sort of yearly sort of summer vacation with my family. We were out to Ascoda, in between Ascoda and Tawas. If uh, anyone here knows where that is, it's on the Lake Huron side, kind of opposite the thumb, just kind of here at the knuckle. And um, really, yeah, it's always, it's always good to, to be on vacation. I, I get this same phenomenon that happens every year. Like, tell me if you've had this before, where you, you take a week off, and it takes you about until day five to finally feel like, right, you're on vacation. You're like, oh, oh, finally get to feel like you're relaxed, settled in, and you're like, dang it, there's only one more day. <laughs> and uh, you get to the end of a week, and you're like, I sure could use another one of those immediately <laughs> uh, because it just feels so good. It's good to be with family, get to relax, get to unwind your brain a little, get to sleep in a little bit, right, recuperate in your body. But... Yeah, just wonderful always to come home again. So we have a um, we have a uh, one of those sort of quite particular and shocking stories in today's uh, episode of Mark's Gospel that I think is um, amazing in its own right. Right to hear right Jesus do something pretty amazing. Right, do these two really big miracles right in a row. But I want to unpack them a little bit more because. I want to help us understand the true sort of import of the moment, the true astonishment of the moment, the real drama and shock of what's really going on, which we could miss simply by reading this story, you know, in sort of 21st century English. (laughs) Um, This takes on a little bit different of a hue uh, if we hear this story, if we understand what's going on as a first century Jew. Um because we want to kind of be amazed in the way that the crowd was amazed, be astonished in the way that the parents here uh, of the little girl were astonished. The scene, of course, is kind of typical, right? It begins with Jesus's growing popularity. It's quite clear at this point in the gospel that lots of people know who he is, right? Lots of people know that he's this miracle worker, that he can do great things, that he comes from God, that he speaks the truth, that he walks in power. So immediately coming across the Sea of Galilee, out of the boat, met by a large crowd of followers who are super curious, like they want to be near this man, who are clearly are, are awaiting someone like this to finally like give them their heart's desire to free them, right? There's a lot of commotion going on. Mark's really clear about some points that we got to pay attention to. One of the points he's really clear about is that people are everywhere and that they're packed in like sardines. They're pressing up against each other. They're, they're pressing up against him. They want, well, they want to get as close to this man as they can. Now, that's a really important thing to notice, especially as the story continues. So as the story continues, right, the synagogue official, Jairus, who's clearly a respected man of the community because, like, the seas part and he comes right before Jesus. And his own moment of distress here is obvious to us. He He is experiencing, in this moment, the dying breaths of his 12-year-old daughter. And he makes a decision in the dying moments of his daughter to leave his daughter and his wife behind. The, The act of faith that this man is making simply to leave a dying daughter and his wife behind, maybe to die alone with each other and have that grief, right, is It's an enormous act of faith that this man is making to leave the situation, to go to Jesus, to say, there is nothing else that I can do. I'm so desperate. I'm so desperate that I will leave even the desperation of this most horrible nightmare that I could ever imagine to go and find the only hope that I have. Jesus knows this, that this is in the man's heart because he knows the situation already, right? He's God. He knows what's going on. But this man comes before me and says, please, come, right, lay your hands on my daughter. She's dying as we speak. This is urgent. Jesus, who is so very merciful, of course, right, is going to oblige and bring life to this place of death, right? He knows that there 
is deep, deep distress going on. And then what's really fascinating is that this incredible moment of very deep distress, very urgent need, is interrupted. And Jesus allows it to be interrupted because the whole story is like sandwiched with this miracle that happens in between of the woman who is suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. This is a really important part of the larger story, particularly if we consider the real meaning of what's going on in this woman's life. So this woman, who has been hemorrhaging for 12 years, this is a very, very difficult predicament, deeply embarrassing predicament for her to be in. She's in a position basically of, as it were, being caught in her cycle for 12 years. And the, if you were a first century Jewish man or woman, you know the laws of your faith that you have to live in. And so one of the, the rules is that the woman in this position becomes what's called ritually unclean, or she's ritually unclean. Now, if as a person, and there are certain circumstances besides this, but this, is, this would be one, if you are ritually unclean, you cannot touch anybody until you become ritually pure again. Or else, that person also becomes ritually unclean. Now, if someone is ritually unclean, guess what they cannot do? They cannot go to the house of God to worship. So if you are ritually unclean, you can't, you can't be near anybody. You can't let anyone touch you, and you cannot touch them. So this woman is actually in the predicament of not being able to connect with anybody in her life for 12 years to no fault of her own but also in the midst of a of a kind of historical tradition where what do people think if bad things happen to someone right what's the what's the thought at that time if something bad happens to you why would something bad happen to you because it's your fault Somehow, somewhere along the line, you did the thing, and now for 12 years, you're bearing the consequences. And this might not even be true, right? And I mean, the implication, right, the assumption here is that you're caught in between a rock and a hard place. So for 12 years, this woman has not embraced her husband or her children. Her husband has probably actually abandoned her at this point. Her children are not in her life at this point. She cannot worship God at this point. She can't go to synagogue. She can't go to temple. She is, in effect, an emaciated widow just by practical consequence in deep, deep suffering. And not only this, right, Mark is clear. She's even spent all of her money with this very, very hard reality in her life Right, without the help of modern medicine, and very much caught in this worsening situation. So this then brings a, a, an additional layer of complexity, because what do we know about the situation? Well, a lot of people are around, so close to each other that everyone is pressing upon everyone else to press upon Jesus, and this woman is here to find a cure because she's that desperate but she can't touch anybody because if she does, guess what happens? <laughs> so she is in this very delicate position of needing to not be found out because if she is discovered, she's in big, big trouble. So do you see what's going on now? So here's the interruption now in context. She has to try to find redemption salvation, a cure in secret because if it's made public she has a whole other set of problems to deal with which are not good but she's that desperate and that courageous that she's willing to risk everything to be redeemed to be cured and this is what actually helps us to kind of sift out additional details in the story because it says that this woman touched Jesus' clothes. Why does she touch Jesus' clothes? Because she can't touch Jesus. If she touches Jesus, she knows that she makes Jesus unclean. And she also knows 
that Jesus would know that she knows that they both know what has just happened, right? Uh Uh-huh, okay. So she does it, she's so, like, she's like, what do I do? Like, how do I make this happen? I want to do this, I know this man can do this, but I can't touch him. Even if I touch just the fringe of his clothes, that would be enough. You see now what's happening, like, just like the edge of his garment so that she can get what she needs without jeopardizing him. And so she does, extraordinary act of faith, in a hidden way, in secret, amidst a whole bunch of people, many of whom she's touching or brushing up against. And Jesus, who also knows that this is happening in the background, has a really important purpose for this moment, not only for her, but for the man. Because he knows immediately that power has gone out, that a healing has happened, and he turns around and immediately and he says, who has touched my clothes? Who has touched my clothes? And his disciples are incredulous. They're like, what are you talking about? All the people are pressing upon you. How, how do you say who has touched me? But what Jesus does in this moment is he makes an, an, a public act of invitation to this woman. What he does not do, even though he could, he does not point her out and say, you touched me, because he knows. He already knows. He doesn't ask this question to find anything out that he doesn't already, he's not already aware of. What he is doing is he had, is addressing this woman's need and even addressing this woman's fear about the secrecy that she's under, this great constraint that she's under. So she's like, oh, sh- oot, <laughs> I've been found out. <laughs> I am in big, big trouble because my secret is about to come to light. My situation is about to come to light. But Jesus does not force her to out herself. He says he looks around. He asks the question, but he does not point a finger, and he is unwilling to expose her. He's asking her to make a second extraordinary act of surrender, of faith, And what does she do, right? She turns around, she comes forward, she just prostrates herself before him. And Mark says, she tells the whole truth. And she she tells the whole truth, not in secret. She tells the whole truth out loud to everybody so that everybody knows the situation and that everybody knows what has just happened. And Jesus doesn't invite this woman to sort of make public what was private because he intends to punish her, but because he intends to show the crowd the truth of who he is, and especially to this man whose daughter is dying, the truth of what he's capable of. Because what he could have done is said, huh, you're in big trouble. You know the law. You know that you can't touch people. You know that you shouldn't be here. You know that you have to tell people that you're unclean so that they don't come near you. You didn't do any of those, right? He doesn't say that. He doesn't even say, all right, you know the law. What's supposed to happen next is that you're supposed to go. It's this thing, it's called the mikvah, right? It's a bath. It's a bath that you have to take in order to become ritually pure again. He could have told her, go follow the precepts of the law. Go take your mikvah. He doesn't say that either because he's not here to demand the letter of the law out of this woman to make a point. He's here to be a savior and to show everybody the spirit of inner transformation that he really has come to bring. And he says, daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed of your infliction. He makes no additional demands at all. He says, you and I both know what has just happened because it's exactly what God has intended for all people. And everybody needs to know that. And this is why he invited her to make this public, right, act of, like, say, outing herself. Because what she has done is the right thing. And everybody needs to know the truth of what is right, of what is hidden. And this is exactly why he allows the story to be interrupted. Because in the meantime, what has just happened, daughter has died. But Jesus has just shown this father, I see what is secret. I am aware of what cannot be seen. Just have faith. Just have faith. 
because to all external experiences, the girl is dead. They're too late. He's actually missed her dying breaths. He didn't save the day. The husband did fail. The father couldn't make a way. But Jesus knows the faith of this man as well. And he says, no, don't disregard what you see, what seems to be true, just have faith. And he takes the man, and of course he goes into this place with lots of commotion, all of the griefing, all of the wailing, and he puts out everybody who ridicules him. Those who do not have faith cannot be here. And he takes only Peter, James, and John, the mom and the dad, and the girl. And he brings about the miracle of the raising of the dead because he proves, and he needs to prove in this moment to those who have faith, I am who you think I am. I really am. I really am who you believe I am. And when I invite you, right, to to go into the interior place to make this great act of faith in me. I reward that. I respond to that. I don't leave that by the side of the road. I am Lord over all things, including over life and death. And even when you cannot see what is in secret, I can see what is in secret, and I come to redeem that too. And even when all exterior appearances look like it's lost, I have power over all that too. And he does this, right, in a just super remarkable fashion, which astounds everybody, because you can't bring people back from the dead. But Jesus can. You can't see what's in secret, but Jesus can. And that then becomes like the great lesson when we come and hear gospel stories like this, like that we need to hear over and over and over, right, to be reminded of like how marvelous and how powerful our God is. And if he is capable of these extraordinarily great things, he is certainly capable of every lesser thing as well, which tends to be the place where for the most part we live our lives, each of us. When we have moments in life that are extreme, is Jesus capable? Yes. Most of the time, we mostly live in a less extreme place. Is Jesus capable of those as well? Yeah, he is. And he performs the great to remind us of how conscious he is also of the little. So give us pause, Jesus, right, to, to see as you see this and to understand the, the beauty and the, and the shock and the astonishment as it would have been seen, right? in the moment by those who witnessed it with their, with their own eyes. Are your conceptions and my conceptions of God too small? Are we able to say that, Jesus, I don't know all things, but you have foreseen all things. You know what is dark, and you make all things light, and I surrender myself, I surrender all things to you, that you be glorified and I be saved.